to our series on First John, and before we, um, I need to turn this on first, and then is this uh, is this running? Okay. Yes. Thanks. So welcome to our First John series, and before we enter into that, why don't we take a moment to um, reflect, um, enter into prayer, and um, if there's any. Uh, um, sinful actions we've taken, sinful attitudes we may have held on to um, up until this afternoon um, that might be interfering with us learning from uh, the God who made us and directs our lives. Um, and then we can take this moment to admit those sins um, to God and we can do it in silence um, because God hears our thoughts that we can direct to him. And when we do that, he promises that um, he will cleanse us from unrighteousness and forgive our sins. And it basically, in effect, allows us to start fresh um, and um, have our lives judged by him. So thank you for um, creating us with purpose and for reason, and uh, that you created us good. Um, you declared everything you created to be good. We admit that we make choices sometimes that disappoint you and um, make us not so good. Um, we admit that to you and we thank you that um, you have patience with us and you made a way for us to be forgiven through sending your son Jesus um, to die for our sins um, and pay that price in our place and that you rose him from the dead so that um, we can have the hope of knowing that we too can be um, risen from the dead and spend the rest of eternity um, with you. So with that in mind, help us to learn how you want us to live uh, for the rest of the time on this earth that we're alive, as we wait for your son to return. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, before I begin, uh, Pastor Freddy, I don't think this is running because it's, it's not too good. Okay. All right, well, again, welcome to our um, series on 1 John, and we are in chapter 2 today, um, and so, notice the slide says part one, because we're not going to try to take on the entire chapter two all in one section. So I think what we're going to find is there is a lot in this chapter to unpack. Um, but first, for review, um, I just want to remind us that um, we've been uh, focusing in three areas at, in our youth group as we go through the first job. Um, we've been focusing on learning um, God's assurances for our lives, um, His promises, and uh, we've been trying to pay attention to certain tensions that emerge. Um, so, in chapter 1, just for review, an example, and let me distinguish first between an assurance versus a promise. Whereas a promise is something we're waiting on God to uh, fulfill in the future, mm -hmm. to keep his promise, and it's a future-focused um, reality that we're waiting for. An assurance is something that we have right now, that we can immediately take advantage of. Um, so an example of an assurance from the last chapter of chapter 1 um, is the assurance that we have a God who's of the light and not of the darkness. And that is found in verse 5 of chapter 1. And I remember when I was a kid, I used to have um, nightmares where I would wake up 
out of bed, um, but I wasn't really awake. So I was waking up, but this was part of my dream, and the lights would not turn on. Um, and so um, I remember during those nightmares, it really helped me to remember that um, God's going to um, take care of me. Because it felt like there was like a demonic um, presence. That's what it felt like in my dream, whether there was or wasn't. But regardless, what helped me was to feel that God was with me. Um, and uh, that sense could be strengthened even further with this assurance that God is a God of life. So that should further strengthen my confidence in those moments. Because if that's true, then I don't have to be afraid, even if I'm in a dark circumstance such as the nightmare, where in my nightmare the light's not turned on. So that's how we can, that's an example of how we can take these assurances as we receive them and immediately benefit. I saw a hand go up, and what do you got? Is an assurance, on the, this is a, if we generalize assurances, our mm -hmm. assurances are not dependent on us, it's all, it's all about God, and it's not dependent upon our behavior, be it in fellowship or out of fellowship, right? Is that, that's perfect. Uh, assurance um, does not depend on God. Um, in, in, in a certain degree, um, which is to say that um, if we have an assurance, um, then it's immediately in effect, it's God um, guaranteeing that truth. But um, uh, the reason I slow down and don't go full board is because there's certain, there are certain assurances that are only available to the believer. Um, so it kind of implies that there was a previous um, step of faith or experience of faith or however you would put it um, that resulted in a new relationship where that assurance holds true. Um, so um, there every once in a while are certain conditions, but um, for those who are believers, we don't have to wait any longer for an assurance to hold true for us. Um, so, for example, if we have an assurance um, that we have received um, payment for our sins um, and that we have eternal life through belief, um, then that's something that's available to us now. Um, because it's not just, eternal life is not just a future reality, but. Um, it's a reality built into Jesus himself, and we have him um, in us right now. He's available to us immediately. We can immediately experience the fullness of that life. Because eternal life um, is clarified to include knowing Jesus um, in the Gospel of John. Um, which, uh, Pastor Craig, could you help me? Where in the Gospel of John is that? Does John 6, 47. John 6, oh, verse 7. One, uh, eternal, life. eternal life is knowing. John 17. John 17. Two. So, um, so we immediately have access to a Jesus who we can know. So. And plus, the, the other thing, too, is the reality <coughs> is that sometimes people don't have the assurance. And if they don't, what, what would you say to the person who doesn't have the assurance? As believers, like, you know, like for example, um, they believe in Jesus Christ for eternal life, or uh, but then all of a sudden, two weeks later, they don't have the assurance that they have eternal life. I'll so, describe. So just to repeat, um, Pastor Freddie is uh, posing the question: What do we do with a believer or someone who came to faith in Jesus, but two weeks later? no longer have the assurance that, right. that, uh, they're saved. that they're saved, that they have everlasting life. What would we say to such a person? And that's how you, that's how I'm going to hand up first. Uh, in my own words, I call them confused, but you know, that's my opinion. But I think they just lack getting into the Word. Okay, good. So they might be confused, they might be lack certain knowledge. Yeah. They might need to get into the Word. And what do you know? Yeah, it's like a student doesn't remember everything he said. Maybe yeah. um, like not remembering some principle. If he just reduced something in the text.
textbook, um, he would be reassured that, oh yeah, that's right, this is how it, what I learned in school. And I guess that's the same for the believer. You just point them back to the word and say, see what it says right here, and let it speak for itself. Good. So, um, it pointed out, we sometimes lack, uh, we have memory problems sometimes. We forget, and Peter explicitly states in one of his epistles uh, that um, sometimes we can forget that we have been cleansed from our sins. So forgetting is a real thing that occurs, and that's why um, our renewing our minds with the Word of God is so critical. Um, all right, good. So assurance is something we have available in the here and now immediately. Um, and the principle is uh, um, similar. So if we have an assurance that God is of the light and not of the darkness, mm -hmm. there might be an accompanying principle that says, if we want fellowship um, with that God, and if we want fellowship among one another under the family of our God, that requires that we also be in the light and not in the darkness. So it's a principle that extends out of um, an assurance about God and an assurance about who God is. So um, we've been um, challenging ourselves in the youth group to um, identify either assurances or principles in a given chapter. We kind of give an either or option in that one. Um, a prince, okay, a promise is more future focused. Um, and it might look like the following. If we walk in the light, then the blood of Jesus, our Christ, cleanses us of all sin. So that one's future focused in the sense that it's awaiting us to first fulfill an if-then condition. Um, it says if we walk in the light, mm -hmm. then the blood of Jesus, our Christ, cleanses us of all sin. By the way, um, what does that cleansing have in mind? Is that cleansing of sin guilt? Is that cleansing of a sin lifestyle? Is that both? So that's a question we want, might want to hold in the back of our minds as we continue to read through the epistle um, and attempt to understand uh, what does this that what does this promise translate to in our lives as we walk in the light? Just, just a, a side thought here on what you said about the uh, passage. If you walk in the light and see in the light and fellowship with one another, the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sins. There's a side of it where it doesn't necessarily have to be a future thing. Just give an illustration where my sons were in the backyard one time, and I gave one command, don't go past the sidewalk just stay on this side. There happened to be a sidewalk. We were caretakers of the church property, and there was a sidewalk here that led on to a little tiny piece of property about 10 by 20. And he said, Daddy, can we go on the other side of the sidewalk? I said, as long as you don't go past the big sidewalk, you're okay. So then they started playing with it. But the point is, we have, if we have fellowship, if, if, we, can, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, there's a sense in which if we are walking in the light, and we know that we're walking in the truth, it doesn't have to necessarily be a future reality, but it's like, hey, I'm doing that right now. I have this blood of Jesus that cleanses me from all sins. So there's that sense in which my kids were comforted. It's like, hey, we're not going to pass this side up, so, so we're okay. There was that personal, right then, confidence or assurance that, that it wasn't a future promise that then is going to be pleased. They knew that they were pleasing daddy right then because they didn't go past the big side. So in that same sense. It doesn't have to be a future. Cor correct. The uh, yeah. future can be as soon as immediately, if immediately we are in the light. Yeah, correct. Right. Um, so, all right. Well, um, seems like we're pretty comfortable on those foundations. Mm -hmm. So those are our focuses for the Epistle of John. Um, and so with, oh, um, we didn't hit tensions. Kind of two uh, types of tension we're going to be running into in John, um, and there's a lot of them. That's why they're part of our focus. We got what I like to call dualities. So that would be like light versus darkness, mm -hmm. love versus hate, mm -hmm. um, 
I'd even raise a question, what about sin, um, sin versus clean? Is that a duality? Um, uh, um, those are prominent. It's uh, um, the way John likes to think and communicate. Mm -hmm. And then it challenges us to think about um, which side do I fall in. Um, and so it provides us new choices of where to stand. Um, and then there's another type of tension that I call a puzzler. So uh, a puzzler would have one also from chapter 1. So in verse uh, 7 in chapter 1, it says that through fellowship, as we've discussed, we can be made clean from sin. But then why does the next verse say, if we claim to be without sin, uh, we deceive ourselves? I thought it just said we have access to sin cleansing. So they seem to go against two statements, one right after the other, that seem to um, butt heads. Now some of these uh, puzzlers, if we read a little further and process the thought, we can kind of make sense out of it, such as the one I gave, um, which we discussed last time. But then there's going to be others that are a lot more difficult to work through. Um, and there are a lot of them. And um, a key thing to have sanity of mind as we're going through this book is to take a step back and just realize John seems to be aware of these puzzlers and seems to be okay with it. So, if John feels that way, um, as opposed to like he's just oblivious, I don't think John is like, oh, I didn't think of that. I think he's aware that these tensions exist. Um, the way he lays his book out, especially as um, two conflicting truths occur one right after the other, to me it seems almost like he's doing it on purpose. So. That in and of itself um, could give us a certain assurance that um, he's up to something, he's in control of his own writing, and set us at ease a little. And then the rest is just trying to be quick, patient with the book as it kind of unfolds, and trying to keep as open a mind as possible um, to what he has to say to us. And sometimes that means putting our own systems of thought aside for a bit and let his system emerge first, and try to figure it all out. And I believe there will be a lot of that in the coming um, passages. All right, um, so that's our foundation. I know we spent a little bit of time on that foundation, but I think it's important um, to set that in place before we get into our heads. So now what I'm going to do is direct us to open to chapter 2 of 1st John. We can cover the first 11 verses. You're welcome, by the way, if you want to just listen um, to me read it out loud. That could be easier um, for some. I'm totally welcome to do that. Okay, 1st John chapter 2. I believe I'm reading out of the NIV. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the, in the NIV language, atoning, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. Now the man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. My dear friends, 
I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet, I am writing you a new command. This truth is seen in him and you. Because the darkness is passing, and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light, but hates his brother, is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness, and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he's going, because the darkness has blinded him. Alright, so, um, let's start by, if you want to share what stood out to you, we can start there. And what, something stand out to you, Rocky? Yeah, well, to me, what is one that stands out is, um, again, I'm reading from the King James, right? And he himself, which is, I'm talking about verse 2, and he himself, talking about Jesus Christ, reference to the previous verse, mm -hmm. is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the world. Good this is part of the salvation package, salvation justification package. Yeah. I'm going to bring us to the next slide. Um, mm -hmm. Do you see that third bullet that says background? So what can we know about the background of this book based upon the first two verses of this chapter? And Rocky's already starting to hit on some of our background assumptions. What are our background assumptions for um, the audience and for the church that you write to? And just in general. What do you got, Pete? John is talking to, to the believers. Okay, so uh, he identifies his audience as children. Good. Hey, that's a good observation, and we're going to come back to that. What else do you got? First two verses, right? Yes. Verse one, verse two. Look how many times he mentioned sins. Sins, right? So, there seems to be some background assumptions about sin, it yeah. doesn't there? Yeah. So, what are those background assumptions? That, that these people can sin. Okay, it's good. So, that I write these things to you so that you will not sin. Yeah. But if anyone does sin, then he's saying... Okay, wait, before you even finish that, um, how many assumptions that, uh, is there so far, before she even finishes? Assumption that... Was you there one? Was there more than one? More than one. More than one? What's the first assumption? That so that you may not sin. sin. Good. So the purpose, the game plan is not to sin. Mm -hmm. That's what we're driving towards. Yeah. That's, a, that's mm -hmm. one of the background assumptions. Mm -hmm. This book is about not sinning. Yeah. And then what was the second one? But if sin. anybody does sin, so Okay, good. If any, sin. So our second assumption is that it's possible to sin which is important. Um, and something we want to be mindful of is the majority of the volume of this book <coughs> centers around uh, being not in sin. Mm -hmm. um, the second assumption is a concession. It acknowledges it's possible that we might sin. Right. Um, and we want to pay attention to how brief, he's, how short a time he sits on that. Um, so, he doesn't want to camp there too long, but he does need to say something about that. And what do we learn? Um, so, first we have, the game plan is, we're about not sinning. Mm -hmm. Second assumption is, it is possible to sin, and then what else is in those two verses? Um, I saw Steve's hand first. Okay. Verses 1 and 2 there, chapter 2, is the game plan is not to sin like you said in prep, and you can't say like you said. 
But I think somehow the bigger umbrella is the fact that, you know, um, this eternal life which was with the Father was manifested to us. And these things we have seen and heard, and we tell you that we might have fellowship with one another, and we respond with the Father, with the Son, Jesus Christ. But this fellowship with the Father, with the Son, with each other seems to be the more positive, bigger umbrella thing. And that, like, in a good family, I think that when people are sitting around the table, mm -hmm. Okay, so that was in the first time. I'm going to cut you off because uh, the focus is the first two verses of chapter two. We did hit those foundations, by the way, in chapter one, but we got to really uh, make the most of our time focus on those two verses. Speak to uh, Jesus. Um, you brought up um, the Son. Um, speak to him in those two verses, if you would like. What do you got, Sarah? Uh, first verse is. Uh I think already the tension because mm -hmm. uh, duality mm -hmm. to sin and not to sin. So okay, good. So there's a, a tension. Mm -hmm. uh, good. So you observed a tension between sinning and not sinning. How does that work? Um, what about the person Jesus uh, that Steve brought up? Something important where Jesus fits into this picture uh, just in the first two verses. Is he advocate? Okay, Jesus is serving as an advocate. Mm -hmm. Good. He's in the middle. Good. So, um, Steve reminded us that in the earlier uh, chapter, um, uh, he functions as a part of the fellowship family, but now uh, we're expanding that foundation um, uh, to his role as an advocate. Um, and how does that relate to sin? It takes care of it, doesn't it? And then the NIV says, uh, speaks to the, he speaks to the Father in our defense. Does that mean that there's somebody who's, um, who's bringing a complaint against us? Like the devil, wasn't he, wasn't he um, called the... What was he called? Okay. Okay. So is there, this a different setting? So he could have a courtroom setting in mind. Uh, we don't we don't know exactly if that's what um, John is picturing in this context, but what we do know is there seems to be need for an advocate and us. we're in need of someone to defend us. So he's our our authority in the court yeah. of God. He's like functioning as um, we could call him an attorney. Um, and uh, whatever it is, whatever that function is, it results um, in our defense. Um, and it's, the verse clarifies it's in relation to our sins, which was in the previous chapter. He says, hey, if anyone claims us to be without sin, then we'd be a liar. So... Um, good, so, um, did we miss any, and someone brought up, not just for our sins, but for the whole wide world. So that gives insight into. When you say, uh, please start a case before the Father, is this uh, referring to the judgment day? Um, does it say anything about uh, judgment day in this? Uh, yeah, not really, right? So um, we could put it on our question list. Is there a reason to believe John might be thinking about Judgment Day? No. Um, but there is no immediately, no immediate indicator as of yet um, that he specifically has Judgment Day in mind. So um, these are our background assumptions: is the game plan is not the same, but at the same time. It appears that the sin issue is taken care of, and here's a key question. Um, does it require us to do anything for the sin issue to, to be taken care of? Mm -hmm. Doesn't lay out any conditions, does it? This says for the sins of the whole world. Even the whole world's sins are taken care of in this passage. Um, what about confession of sin? Does this verse say we have to confess our sins for this to hold true? No, it 
They'll even say that we even have to confess our sins for verses 1 through 2 to stand. This is an unconditional assurance. Jesus has done this for the world. It stands done. That's our foundation. So, everything uh, <laughs> that fits into if-then type statements, such as if we confess our sins, if we walk in the light as you're in the light, he'll cleanse our sins. Um, all those things we presume to be a bonus on top of the things Jesus has already done that these first two verses state. So there's stuff that Jesus has done already, and then there might be some bonus packages, some really important bonus packages, in fact. Um, we're not meant to just stay in verses 1 through 2. We're meant to not sin. That's, in fact, why does the author write? What is the purpose of his writing? According to um, chapter two, he good. He writes so that we will not sin. We want to keep the purpose of his writing in mind. And also, verse four. Because if that's his purpose, um, then what we can anticipate is he's going to give us some principles, some game plans of uh, how we go about this not sin. He gives us a roadmap, and you're going to add uh, verse four. Well, you're going to add about four. Chapter one, though, verse four. Okay. Um, so, yeah, and we covered that uh, um, last time, and so we're building, we're adding to what we already have. Um, I, I, yeah, so I'm just trying to be time conscious. Um, okay, so covered the author. Um, I do want to raise the question about the audience. Uh, um, uh, what are the two ways in this chapter he identified his audience? Um, I'll give you the answer and then raise the question, what's that all about? So, he calls his audience children in one instance, verse 1. And then he calls his audience brothers in a later instance, in verses 7 through 11. Now, is he just having fun with uh, my labels? Um, or is he being intentional with, what do you got, Arnold? What do you got? <coughs> is he talking about a greeting of endearment or different stages of believers? Hmm. I don't know. Because he's, he, in NASB and New King James, there's little children, there's... You know. Yeah. So, could he have stages um, of who we are now? as those under the family of God. So is there significance to us being children? Does that mean we're meant to grow into something? Yeah. More later on chapter 3 in that regard. Um, what about the brothers? Why would he call us brothers in a later section? Why not just keep it children all the way through? Maybe a progression. Okay, what, um, do you notice anything in verses 7 through 11? That's where he switches to brothers. Mine says friends. friends yeah. Yours says friends? What is yours? Brethren. Yours says brethren? Brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters. Or beloved. 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 I'm embarrassed because uh, I should have pre-checked to determine if it says adult boss. That's brother, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if anyone just magically has a Greek Okay. Is it that we are in Technon? Um, well, Technon would be children. I'm pretty sure that's uh, verse 1. But what about verse 7? Adelphos. Adelphos, thank you. Adelphos. So that's, uh, we can translate these things different ways, but the Greek word Adelphos has the brother. Hey, by the way, uh, this is great that we're discussing this because we now are noticing that English translations feel the freedom to just flip-flop, flip -flop, interchange it as the ah, friend, brother, what's the difference? Mm -hmm. But um, I, I want to raise the question, um, to call us brothers, does that have a significance in verses 7 through 11? 
you notice anything? <coughs> uh, with me, my question is on chapter 7, I mean, verse 7 goes, I write no, no new commandment but an old commandment. What is that old commandment? Right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I can't find it here in these verses. And again, number 8 says, a new commandment I write to you. Where's, where is that new commandment? Okay, we'll come there later. Okay. Um, and you said technon means technon's children. Um, That's translated children. It's either translated children or little children. Um, and that's um, verse one. That's that would be verse one. But what about seven through eleven? He switches the brothers. Did you notice anything? Well, when you're talking about the first context, it seems like you're talking about almost something that children would understand: truth versus a lie. In the context of you know Father God is perfected in you, but then you go to brother, and then the same context is talking if you hate your brother, he's calling him brother, and if you are brother, yeah. there's a sort of a connection there that you're moving it up a stage to oh. that was great on both accounts. I want to review what Steve just brought up. Okay. First uh, he he notices we uh, he used the word perfect. So he starts with addressing children and then if we follow the flow of thought through, we find that um, the love uh, of God is meant to be perfected in us or completed. Mm -hmm. So there's a maturation involved. I think he is not just throwing around children because it sounds cool or he's trying to like put himself at the top looking down upon you children. I don't think John is doing this. Yeah. Maybe he is, but... If you just ask, well, what is a child? A child doesn't <clears throat> what? A child grows into something. Mm -hmm. And so now we see that there's a love of God that's meant to be completed mm -hmm. in us. So there's a maturation. Okay. Um, we're going to see more maturation uh, um, throughout the rest of the book. Um, now, it's, the other thing Steve brought up is, then he switches to calling us brethren, yeah. and then he starts to discuss, well, how do how are brothers supposed to interrelate to each other? Um, and discusses that we could either love our brother or hate our brother. So, um, every chapter uh, um, anticipate that I might return us to these foundations of what can we know about the author? What can we know about the audience? What can we know about the background assumptions um, and the hero and the focus? And that uh, we might get a little bit bigger of a picture in the next chapter and a little bit big, bigger picture in the next chapter. Um, these are background considerations, but we don't need to go find a background commentary. We can just let the book define itself. And we've already learned that the audience he has in mind are those who are meant um, to be childlike and grow up into something. And also his audience he has in mind um, brothers who are meant to be brotherly and sisterly. So those words for John are meaningful. And we want to be attentive to that. Micah's Greek shows anapetoi which says it means beloved, or verse 7. It says toy. Agape, like agape. agape toy. Is there a variant in that? Because uh, uh, you're of adelphos, right? Verse 7 for brethren. Oh, okay, so my the possible guess I have is um, there could be a textual variant, which means that different manuscript trans, uh, traditions um, have different uh, um, translations. So what that means is um, I, back in the very first century, um, John wrote his epistle, but we don't have his original document. We make copies and then people take those copies and make further copies and then eventually the copies go out to different places in the world and there's different families of copies, so we call those manuscript families, and sooner or later, uh, every once in a while, differences creep in, um, and it creates a, um, a scholarly uh, problem, because now we have to determine 
um, what is the, most likely to be the original word that the original author was using. So that's called lower textual criticism. Um, so that could be happening. Um, and what did you say it says, sir? I'm a toy. Four five. Four. No. Um, the first okay. word? Two seven. So some translations translate it beloved instead of brothers. Um, and her Greek says agapetoi, mm -hmm. which uh, agape is love. So right, right. Okay. beloved, yeah. So that suggests to me there might be a yeah. um, variant, textual variant in that verse. Um, <coughs> all right, we are not going to get the far view, but this is important. Important stuff. So, um, I do want to ask, uh, what what do we learn about, so we discussed, uh, let's review, who's the hero in this book? You guys remember who it was? Jesus. Jesus in the previous chapter seemed to be the hero, because mm -hmm. he's testifying to who he's seen and heard. So now I want to ask, how does that get further developed in this chapter? What do we learn about the hero in um, verses 1 through 2? He's a satisfaction for our sins. Good. He's, our, he's a satisfaction for our sins. Um, he's the something for our sins. Different translations translate it differently. Um, so here, let's, um, I'm going to show us the first... Um, since we're talking about, oh no, the Greek's not in there. Here's our quiz question number two. Um, verse two calls Jesus the hilosmos for our sins. So that's the actual Greek word. But notice how different English translations translate differently. <coughs> so the question I want to raise is, the very safest translation would be to say, Jesus is the blank. For our sins. What do we fill the blank in with? A. So I hear some saying A, propitiation. I hear some saying what? E. I hear some saying E. A. Um, I hear some saying C. So I've heard propitiation, I've heard atonement, I've heard solution. Huh? A. E. A is sacrifice. I hear sacrifice. It's easy to drop me, you know. A. <laughs> Well, let's see what the um, all-knowing all slide uh, says. Well, interesting. So according to Mr. Slide, it says solution or appeasement. Let's go back and check some of these. Um, I need a volunteer. Who's going to be a volunteer? Any volunteers? No. You've only volunteered yourself. Okay, so you're volunteering? Hey, when was the last time you did some propitiating? Um, when was the last time? Like oh, wait. So you don't know exactly what that word means? Yeah. Okay. But some translations assume you do because it uses that word. Mm -hmm. um, propitiation. What about you, Mark? Uh, when was the last time you did some propitiating? <laughs> Just some plain old propitiating. I, I don't know. Okay, here's a... Uh, Here's the, here's the issue uh, is when uh, with that word situation as soon as Rafi because Rafi just said he's going to tell us what that means before he even opens his mouth uh, whatever comes out of his mouth you're going to have uh, two or three other scholars giving a completely different meaning of that word so go ahead who's the scholar? Oh, well, I'll tell you in a second but I want to first uh Open that mouth and what comes out? Well, is it propitiation, the satisfaction for, for the sin debt, or the atonement? Uh, basically, when for our sins, the um, the uh, the penalty is sin, is death, right? Isn't this the satisfaction of that of that uh, uh, of that penalty? Okay, so I heard satisfaction. So that's one word. I heard sin debt. And you said penalty, implying penalty needs to be paid. And uh, you said uh, death. It's satisfaction of God's wrath. So that, and now there's wrath. Right. Satisfaction there's for God's wrath. Five. So we already have 
five significant <coughs> concepts somehow bundled into that word that we're saying John is using a word that children uh, understand that word in five different directions. That, uh, is that what John expects out of his childlike audience? Probably not. Maybe not. So we always want to back up and ask the question, is that really what John is intending to mean? Or is that what we're later as theologians building into that word? Um, and so that's uh, something that um, um, I want to slow us down on, is using words that, uh, um, getting used to using words before we know what we're loading into the words. Because these kind of words, technical words, can be like huge packages. And the bigger those packages get, um, uh, the more it calls into question, okay, I did, um, is he really uh, meaning that by this word? Now, if you look at the context, can we recall what, um, what kind of activity Jesus was in the business of doing in this context? It's the middleman, right? Okay, good. Middleman, defending us. Um, advocate. So, advocate. So now he does something with the sin that results in advocacy. So the safest word would be the solution for our sins. Well, um, he, he is, in, in the context of the Father, mm -hmm. he, is, he is the uh, he's the solution or is he satisfying the Father? Okay, and now the moment we say satisfy, um, we raise, it raises the question, satisfies what? And that's where you run into Rafi's thing, where we've got like five different theological problems going on in parallel. Um, so, um, now, um, according to a background commentary that I cannot verify their research, um, it claims that um, a common listener would understand the lost moss to just simply mean appeasement which is, just to use a simple word, uh, um, just kind of a cooling up, just picture like, um, we're real angry, and then I just need to get a drink of water, cool down. So, the ultimate end game effect is the cooling up. Now, the moment we start to ask, well, how exactly does that work? Is he, uh, um, is he paying the price for sins? Is he providing atonement, which means he's uh, covering up the sin? By the way, did you know that that's what atonement is? Mm -hmm. um, I bet not everyone knows that, though. Yeah. Um, because uh, when we throw around the word atonement, it makes it sound like, oh, it's all taken care of. But um, if you cover something up, then... Uh, so if uh, there's a stain on the ground, and I put a, a rug over the stain, has that stain gone away? No, the stain's still there. And that was the issue with this, the animal sacrifice system. So is that what we're meaning by um, appeasement? That he's just uh, um, like covering up so God doesn't see it, and he's not angry anymore? See, the moment we go beyond uh, a meaning like appeasement or solution, um, and now we're working under the hood, and then that's where you're going to have different scholars uh, putting different words in. So appeasement has a collective meaning, maybe atonement? Maybe. Yeah, I think John is most focused on uh, what is the ultimate result. We're now at peace with God. That, that tension has gone away. Whatever that problem is that sin has created, that goes away. It's been appeased. How exactly that happened, I don't think John's trying to go there because if he were to, I think he would lay out exactly in a technical way the way Paul does. Paul loves to go there. He was loves to go there and explain exactly how um, it all works out. But is that really John's end game? Or is John's end game to say that, hey, if we sin, um, that's been worked out through Jesus, our advocate. A, we have an advocate 
um, who speaks to our defense, and B, um, uh, the sin has been appeased. Whether or not we can uh, lay out exactly how that comes about. Um, so the reason I wanted to spend some time on here was given the fact that um, so I, it wasn't necessarily my game plan today, one way or the other, to hit this in depth. But what I noticed is there was at least three different translations in the audience saying three different words. So it suggested to me it's time now to go there. Okay, so with the remaining time, um, that hero gets developed, as we just discussed, because now the hero is our advocate. <laughs> that appeases. Um, and then there's another thing that hero uh, is for us, according to verse. Verse 6. about the hero further in verse 6. Anyone? Uh, verse 6? Yeah, verse 6. What do we learn about the hero in verse 6? He lived in God. Jesus lived in God. So we should basically, our hero is an example. Good. Uh, we learn that our hero Jesus is an example, a model for us. Um, we were having a conversation a week ago of uh, um, someone rightly pointed out, um, this book is very abstract. There's not a lot of tangible stuff to grab. Um, and then we had a discussion about, um, there's, true, there's not a whole lot of verses that make it tangible and <coughs> graspable. But the few verses that we do have um, paint a pretty big picture. Um, and this is one of them. So if we want to understand what living in the light looks like, what obey, obeying the command looks like, what love looks like, we have uh, nothing, nothing better than the model of Jesus himself. And we have an entire gospel that we could look at, written by the same author, that lays out all the things that um, this model did that suggests um, what kind of a loving, um, obedient, light-filled person this man Jesus was. Can anyone think of an example from the Gospel of John? Of what? Of uh, Jesus being a role model. Mm -hmm. Wilderness. The wilderness, right? Okay, was that in the Gospel of John? Uh, he did that too, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. That's Matthew. So that's Matthew. Uh, he, but he was a model in that he was willing to what about the adulterer? abstain from um, food. What about what he did with the adulterer? Okay, and what did he do with the adulterer? Um, or adulteress? He showed compassion. Okay, good. So he was compassionate towards an adulteress, which is that common? You find out somebody like messes around with other men or women. Is compassion the first instinct? No. Um, treatment of such a person? Not really, right? We usually look down on such a person. Mm -hmm. Jesus is a very um, contrarian example for us. Um, and at the end of the day, was it constructive? Um, well, um, it led to, or he closes the whole thought with, now go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. Starts with compassion, and now he's advocating change. So it's different approach than shame on you, as though that person doesn't already live in shame. Right. Whether the person lives in shame and is aware of the shame, or whether they're suppressing and avoiding the shame. Mm -hmm. Different people react differently to shame. Um, and we all have um, past shame, and that brings us back to First John chapter 1. If anyone claims to be without sin, I've, they're just deceiving themselves. We're good at self-deception. So, but Jesus um, is about the light and exposing um, 
the darkness. So um, he's our role model. He treats uh, people who need compassion with compassion, um, and that's just a beginning because. Um, there's a full 21 chapters in just the Gospel of John filled with uh, ways that Jesus <coughs> did himself. I'm sure you guys remember that he washed his um, disciples' feet. And got on his knees and lowered himself in that way. Sure caused a reaction from the disciples who said, no, don't do that. <coughs> so when we unpackage that one verse, um, it becomes a very concrete picture, very visual and uh, touchable. Um, and we can do that legitimately because you wrote a gospel. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we have to worry about us loading our own meaning in. Because if we base it out of John's gospel, then we're consistent with John's intended meaning. Uh, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. So, um, it's okay for John to go into abstracts, especially after having written such a concrete gospel. Now he's loading us up with some big picture principles, um, assurances, and general life outlooks. Um, over, uh, the sum total of what we're about as a community is we're a community... Um, that is of the light rather than the darkness, of love rather than hate, we're obedient, we're together in fellowship, is about togetherness. Um, Jesus is our center, the Christ is. We're going to learn that later antichrists uh, will attempt to take Jesus out of the center. So there, are, even in as abstract a book as this is, it's still very meaningful and it's still lays out some big sweeping principles that are critical to the foundation of who we are as a church. So, um, for the last few minutes, um, we can do one of two things. I can try to find uh, some of the most interesting quiz questions um, to challenge you with, or you could raise your own questions uh, in a discussion of that. If no one raises questions, I mean, yeah, what do you got? First, is that an independent sentence, or is it relying on verse 1 and 2? Verse 3 says, we know that we have come <coughs> to know him if, okay, so that, if is going to say the dependency relationship. So it has nothing to do with one and two. What's that? It has nothing to do with, with verse one and two. Um, maybe not directly. I mean, the most immediate depend. So he's saying we know that we've come to know him if. So we always got to start first with well, if what. And then we find, oh, if we obey his commands. Uh, now, that's not to say that verses 1 and 2 don't relate, because if we read verse 1, um, it says the game plan is he writes, but we don't sin. Well, if we don't want to sin, what do we need? Well, we need some commands. Um, okay, speaking of which, um, I'm going to bring us to a... Um, okay. Um, uh, in verses 7 through 8, John speaks of an old and yet new command for his beloved. Verses 9 through 11 appear to clarify and indicate that that command is to, and then what do you think? I got one. So, what, which one do you think? F, love one another. It's not there. Um, uh, is it there? Maybe. F. <laughs> huh? I think it might be represented in those uh, options. Are you uh, are, are you a B guy? No, I'm not. One fellow brother? Yeah, that's the one. No, no, open another. Anyone who doesn't think this is B. So we know that we've come to know him um, if we obey his commands. And then 
as he takes us through that command that becomes clarified because now he's speaking about uh, anyone who loves his brother is in the light, anyone who hates his brother is still in the darkness and it lays those things out. So, now why does John call this command an old command? <coughs> What? Okay, so uh, how would you, where, so where would you fall in these options? Uh, but he was writing to those who had the command from the very beginning. From the very beginning. From the very beginning. That's okay. the question. When's that the beginning? And what about D? The command is from the Mosaic Law and no longer applies to believers today. What do you think about that one? That's possible. Is it, is it possible? What do you guys think? Is that in the Ten Commandments? Huh? See, both A and B? Oh. Wait. When's the Mosaic Law dropped out? Let's go back. Why, uh, uh, what's the problem with B? Well, the problem with B is this. That's the Mosaic Law, right? Mm -hmm. And how... So that's wrong because the command has to be applicable then Good. and applicable now. This is a command that does apply to believers today. Today, yeah. So more rightfully has in mind the command Jesus gave from the very beginning, which was a new command I give you love one another. He seems to just like just like a person who would be a parent saying to a kid, don't go out in the street, Johnny. Because you get hurt, hold my hand, and that's like an old command. But then the new command is, you know, almost like, okay, you can go out with me now, but you don't have to hold my hand. There's a sense of it's sort of a step up from the old command. Love one another as I love you, but here's an additional variation of it that if you hate your brother, you are walking in the darkness, and it sort of takes his light versus darkness thing and sort of accentuates and add sort of a new twist to it. Good. There, there needs to be some kind of new twist that's being laid out. And before we raise that question, um, just tying back into Arnold's question, which was relevant, um, was that he was asking in verse 3, um, we know that we've come to know him if we obey his commands. Um, and this is not only that, but this is a command that um, they've had from the beginning. Yeah. So they're already in a position to be able to fulfill verse 3. They're in a position where they could have come to know him because he already, Jesus already gave the command to love um, one another. And he modeled it through the foot washing. He modeled it in many ways. And finally, why does, and we'll close on this, why does John call his command a new command? Just like what Steve was saying? Oh, this one? Yeah, so um, A says it speaks to a new age that calls for a new way of living. Um, B, the new light's already shining. <coughs> is passing away. C. This truth can nowadays be witnessed in both Jesus and the brethren. Or D. All the above. A. All of e. either A, B, and D. B. E. Huh? So, um. Should I show, or do you guys want to justify? We don't have time. We don't have time. Yeah. All of the above. Because e. E. A, the verse itself says, the new light's already shining, and the present darkness is passing away. That's the sense in which it's new. That's a eschatological outlook. Fancy word for saying, that's an outlook in mind, having in mind that the age is changing from an old age into a new kind of age. We're now moving into becoming a new kind of people, um, which covers C. Yeah. He states its truth um, has been seen in him and now witnessed in you. 
So it's new in that um, now we're live, able to live this out. Um, so we may have, may have been aware of the command before, but now it's a command we can actually see being realized first in Jesus and now in us, mm -hmm. um, according to John's argument. And then A is a restatement of B. It speaks to a new age that calls for a new way of living, is what um, John is aiming at, not just in this passage, but for the entire book. And um, we can close on that note. Um, and well done, everyone. prayer. God, help us to live uh, in, this, in the new age that we trust is coming about. We know you promised that you're bringing about a new age. You say that the present darkness uh, is going to be passing away and that the new light is already shining. So help us to realize that the light is among us. Help us to see that light, um, whether it be in things you reveal to us, uh, um, whether it be in those we're around, because um, we aim to be a people of light. Help us to have a strong fellowship and togetherness and to feel um, a sense that we're joined to you and your son Jesus. Because um, we know that all fellowship is anchored in you. Um, and we know that um, you made us children so that we grow into something new. And we trust that you're giving us that new birth and that new growth. And help us to live in light of that. In Jesus' name. Amen.